Davis steps under center. Gibson and McClendon behind it. Davis with motion by Richard. Will get the ball to McClendon. He leaps. Oh, he doesn't get in. He fumbled the football. Carolina holds. The game is over. And Carolina has won the game. Ben lead to throw. Over the middle. Intercepted. Wolfuck again. Wolfuck the other way. At the 30. The 40. Wolfuck to midfield. Miles Wolfuck with the pick. The heels on the doorstep of an enormous victory. Left side of the line. Hood standing to Williams' is right. Williams going to throw. One-on-one. Davis has it. Touchdown. Carolina wins. Carolina is the Coastal Division champion. Bernard fields it at the 26. Heading to the far side. Gio at the 35. Gio, he's at the 50. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Gio is going to take it for a touchdown. for the possible win. Snap, spot, kick away, high enough, long enough. It's good! It's good! Carolina has won the game on a 42-yard field goal by freshman Hunter Burr. Good gosh, dirty. This is the Heel Tough Blog Hey guys, and welcome to another edition of the Heel Tough Blog Podcast. It's your host, Anthony Pegnata, as always with you. And tonight, we are back on the recruiting trail. The Tar Heels land a 2022 four-star linebacker in Sebastian Cheeks. We're going to break down his commitment, what it means for Carolina, and uh, how quickly they've sort of turned things around following the miss of Dalen Everett just a couple of weekends ago. Uh, We'll also uh, talk about the fact that Carolina misses on uh, five-star cornerback Jaden Lucas. Not really a shock, but we'll we'll tell you what it ultimately means for the Tar Heels in the 2022 class. And then uh, look ahead to a couple of guys that will be announcing their commitments, have the Tar Heels in their final three schools, uh, and we'll tell you whether or not we think there's any chance that the Tar Heels end up picking up those commitments over the next couple of weeks. As always, I'll be joined tonight by the recruiting analyst here for the Heel Tough blog and the Heel Tough blog podcast. It is Zach Hubbard who is with us. And uh, how's it going tonight, man? It's going good, going good. Obviously, have a commitment to discuss tonight, so that's always a, a great time. But, you know, there's still a lot going on. It's sort of getting towards the end of the summer, moving forward into August and fall camp and the actual season, which is exciting, but still have, you know, a little bit of recruiting news here. Uh, as the summer winds down. Well, we are in the midst of a a pretty big recruiting weekend uh, coming up for the Tar Heels uh, here. uh, Over the weekend, the Tar Heels will be hosting their uh, cookout, which is, you know, basically just a gathering where they invite some of the big name targets that they have in the 2022 class that are remaining. But mainly, this is for the 2023 class. I know that Inside Carolina has put up a list of all the visitors that are going to be there, and it's it's a pretty stacked list. Yeah, I, you guys can go check that out over there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is a, a pretty big week for Carolina, and they sort of kicked it off on Wednesday when they landed the commitment of four-star inside linebacker from the state of Illinois, Sebastian Cheeks. You know, we talked about him a little bit on our last recruiting edition of the podcast. Uh, you know, bro, you know, we, we made our predictions and we both thought that he would ultimately end up at Carolina. But this was a fascinating recruitment because originally this was a guy that coming out of the state of Illinois, as you would kind of expect, Big Ten schools were really the main factor there. But Notre Dame, that's another area where they recruit very, very well. Uh, they were the favorite for him for a very long time. Uh, Notre Dame was was pretty high on him, but uh, they they ended up filling up there. They had other guys that they felt were better fits, I guess, for their defense. Um, it is a little bit shocking considering that this is a guy that's inside of the top 150. So uh, I think that really just shows the level that Notre Dame can recruit, especially on the defensive side of the ball and at linebacker. But uh, yeah. 
Carolina was one of the teams that sort of swooped in and uh, had a chance there. They made a pretty solid, uh, you know, statement when they hosted Sebastian Cheeks back on uh, June 4th through the 6th. Uh, that was uh, one where, you know, the, everybody was kind of focused on the other two guys that visited campus during that weekend. There were a lot of positive vibes around the two guys that visited. But ultimately, uh, you know, the, the, the guy, it looks like that, probably it ended up affecting the most was Sebastian Cheeks, even though he was the guy that wasn't talked about quite as much as the others. Because Carolina, even though at that time, it looked like Texas was the team that had sort of you know, t- taken over uh, the reins of that recruitment, were able to sort of build a little bit mo- of momentum as Notre Dame had moved on to some of their other targets. Carolina was the team lurking in the shadows, and all of a sudden over these past couple of weeks, Carolina made a really good push late for them, and now they've landed a commitment in this class. And, you know, first of all, when we talk about the prospects, Zach, what do you like about what you see from Sebastian Cheeks on tape, and how do you think he fits this Jay Bateman defense? I think the one thing that you have to mention first and foremost is his versatility, and that's sort of a factor for recruits, specifically defensive recruits, you know, that we've mentioned often as it relates to this Jay Bateman defense. Uh, For those listen to you know some of the um, past editions of podcasts when we sort of profiled in you know projects as a linebacker probably more likely than not as a as a, an inside linebacker but has that experience as sort of the outside linebacker Russian or edge concept um, can definitely play that and does at, at several times really does what his high school needs him to do um, at the linebacker position, but you look at him just from a physical standpoint, looks at, at 6 3, 2 10, so you know, has good length for a linebacker, not exactly the you know, 6 5, 6 6 that you'd see from some of your first round guys on the edge, uh, but sort of offers you that option where he can be, you know, this long guy, this rangy guy at the inside linebacker position, can you know, can move sideline to the sideline, can move all over the place, and then. You know, use that length to, to disrupt, um, you know, the football in the air on passing plays. And then, you know, we saw a little bit of how he can be used in an edge roll uh, from ways that we saw Chasserat, um in the past two seasons at linebacker used where they would sort of roll him down. Maybe he'd sort of line up a little bit, you know, on the far end of the edge or he'd, you know, line up just over uh, the nose tackle there and then rush from that position. So I, I think that he's got a diverse skill set. Um, he offers you a lot of options. And like we mentioned, Jay Bateman loves these guys that can do several things that allow you to sort of mix and match these pieces. I mean, they're always looking to put the best 11 on the field at any point, but you look at it, you know, we can roll out several options uh depending on the opponent, depending on the play, that really makes this defense not only flexible, uh, but versatile and unpredictable. And I think that Sebastian is just another piece to that puzzle that gives this defense a lot of options. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think he fits the mold very well of what Jay Bateman is looking for from his guys. Extremely athletic, sideline to sideline type of guy, um, and and sort of lived in the backfield on tape uh, just because of how fast he is uh, in open space. He's able to beat you know offensive linemen in space very easily. Uh, really solid tackler. Um, but I think the thing that I, I may surprise people the most about him is if you watch him in coverage, he is a, a guy that looks extremely comfortable. Uh, and and look, you know, we, we have a couple of guys like that on the roster now. I, I wouldn't say extremely comfortable for Power Eccles. He, he was a guy that did it uh, at the high school level. He, he's one of those guys that's going to project more as the guy that is going to rack up the big tackle numbers. He's going to help you a lot more in the run game, but he can do that better than maybe some of the guys in the past. Um, but definitely, uh, Ra Ra Dilworth is a guy that you look at in that ilk. I think that Sebastian Cheeks is is similar to him. Um, I don't think he's getting quite the recognition that Dilworth did a year ago. Um, I think part of that is because, you know, him being from Illinois, he, he's not quite as heavily covered in this region. So you don't have a, a lot of people that cover the Tar Heels that can watch him, you know, week in and week out whenever he's going through the high school football season. But 
Yeah, this is, like you said, a very versatile option. It gives Carolina, um, you know, some, some flexibility to use him at, at different, you know, different spots or, or really, uh, I mean, they'll still use him at linebacker, but in different ways. And that's kind of what Jay Bateman is looking for. He's looking for guys that he can throw out there that can sort of give offense is a different look than they're normally used to and this is what Sebastian Cheeks does for you and the big thing here is is that you know this is a guy that's got four star talent and you look at the depth chart and you know if you go back and listen to the preview of the linebackers uh, for this 2021 season you'll see that it's very obvious that this is one of the few positions for Carolina right now that still kind of lacks that depth. And it means that, one, there's going to be plenty of opportunity when he comes in. And two, they are still looking to get those guys in there that can sort of, you know, get you to a point where if you have to take guys off the field, the guys that are coming in behind them are not a drop-off in talent. I don't think that's necessarily a big issue for the unit in terms of the competitive talent, the competitive depth that is behind uh, the guys that are there right now that are going to be your starters this year. But I do think that you look at the unit and it still is a little bit thin. And also remember that you are going to lose Jeremiah Gimmel at the end of the season more than likely. There's a chance that he could, of course, return because of the COVID-19 uh, season from uh, last year. But I- I'm going to be honest with you. I think he's a guy that if he lives up to his potential this year, he's probably going to be an NFL guy and he will probably end up going to the NFL draft. So there will be opportunity for Sebastian Cheeks when he comes in. Uh, this is pretty much it for Carolina at linebacker. They don't have any other targets that are out there. Um, and, and it feels like getting him in the middle of the defense is, is really you know the lone addition that they're looking for. You don't need a ton of depth inside there uh, at inside linebacker. I mean, it's pretty obvious uh, over the past couple of years, you can see it at the NFL level in the NFL draft that – Guys don't really, the the value is just not there at this position right now. It's not a position that's needed as much as many of the other positions throughout the defense. So uh, for Carolina, it feels like they're probably done there. Uh, And then one other position that they may end up being done at is cornerback. And that is because their lone remaining target, and you know, again, The last couple of weeks of this recruitment, it didn't look like they were going to land him. Uh, It looked like he was pretty solidly, uh, already silently committed, I should say, to Clemson. Uh, And that is five-star cornerback Jaden Lucas. I think the biggest question that some people have, Zach, is, is uh, is this it for Carolina in terms of their cornerback targets in this class? I don't think that they needed another one. I feel like that when it came to Dalen Everett and him committing elsewhere and where Carolina felt they were at with him, some people felt like this had suddenly become a need to get another corner in this class. But with uh, Marcus Allen uh, already in place and Teon Holloway, uh, this is probably a pretty good stash here at cornerback for the Tar Heels, and uh, it likely means that they're done, right? Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, I think that they do want to add other defensive backs. Obviously, you still have uh, three-star safety from Georgia, Jake Pope on the board. But I think that I, – I don't think that it is a definitive we are done at quarterback or we are done at defensive back. I think that it could be a position where – you know, they, they see a number of options sort of come into play. I mean, when you look at these past two classes, specifically under Matt Brown, there's all, always been one or two guys that just seem to pop up as options for North Carolina, you know, towards the winter, towards National Signing Day. Uh, that they're able to swoop in and get uh, Eugene Asante comes to mind as one. I believe Don Chapman was one that they sort of found in the fall and were able to recruit and, you know, get in there. Uh, Trade down Stevenson and pass Don- back definitely comes to mind. So Dante they- Balfour was one last year. Yep. Yes, thank you. That's the name I was forgetting, Dante Balfour. Uh, another cornerback that they were able to get late. Um, so I think – just in terms of the high school route, there are likely to be names that are going to have good senior seasons. They're going to rise up uh, college recruiting boards. I mean, 
as we've discussed in the past, the 2022 class for a lot of schools is going to be smaller. Now, obviously, for North Carolina, it's probably going to be a little bit smaller, but that means that other schools will more likely than not have smaller classes too, which could lead to them being in a good position for one of these late risers. There's that option. I think that... You know, as we've discussed, the transfer portal moving forward just in college football as a whole uh, will continue to be a big factor. And obviously it hasn't been, you know, really a way that North Carolina wants to build its whole roster. They've been sort of very selective about the transfers that they take. Um, They took one, just one this past year um, in uh, Ty Chandler out of Tennessee, but that could be another position. If they feel like that there's a guy, um, either that's an upperclassman that's transferring, you know, they want somebody to come in and compete for starting time immediately, or if there's a guy, uh, which I think that we'll see more and more so, um, you're going to see guys that are true freshman transfers from other schools that, you know, especially after the 2021 uh, recruiting cycle that we had where, you know, a lot of guys didn't get on campus. I, I feel like there's going to be probably at least some portion of kids that are going to get on these college campuses here in the fall are not really going to feel that they fit or feel that they sort of get from a school what they thought they were getting uh, just from Zoom recruiting. So I think that over the next, you know, year to two, uh, the transfer portal will be big just in college football in the, in the whole. So, you know, North Carolina could look for that route. So is there a guy on the board today? I would say no, but there's so many options moving forward into the fall and into the winter. And when you're a team like North Carolina, not necessarily at the lower end, definitely not at the lower end, but not necessarily, you know, a top five team, it really gives you some wiggle room because your roster is not just, you know, filled to the brim with guys such as your Ohio States or your Alabamas that see, you know, double digit transfers almost every year. Uh, so you still have that room to add talented guys, but you're also a destination. And I think that gives them a lot of wiggle room moving forward in this recruiting cycle. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think that's uh, that that's spot on right there. I think that they are definitely, and they made it pretty well known that they are going to leave room in case there is a transfer that they, uh, they, they want. And look, corner is one of those spots that they have gone into the transfer portal before. Um, it's worked out with a guy like Kyler McMichael. There are other times where it hasn't worked out in their favor, although never really got a chance to see it, in Bryce Watts. So, I mean, that's one of the positions that I feel like if they if they need somebody else, they will go into the portal and get somebody. But it's also a spot where uh, I agree with you. I think that's one of those spots where it, it, we've seen it the last couple of classes because, as you mentioned, you know, with Don Chapman uh, and Dante Balfour, uh, those are two guys that sort of jumped onto – the scene pretty late and Carolina jumped in and made quick work in their recruitments and landed them pretty quickly. I think that this is one of those spots where you can have guys that sort of come out of nowhere, jump onto the scene. And with this being a normal season with you know high school football, I think that they are going to get to evaluate guys in the fall as opposed to last year when, you know, the seasons got moved around a little bit. You had some, you know, states that didn't even play. So you were even more limited than you normally were in terms of trying to get looks at these guys and give out scholarship offers. This year, you'll have everybody playing normal schedules as we know of. And, you know, th- it'll be a chance for them to sort of evaluate what's out there and maybe spread an offer or two around. But I, I think that at the moment, uh, they're still in a really good spot right now at cornerback. You're, you're talking about Tony Grimes, who we know is going to have to be there for at least one more year. I think Storm Duck is a guy that some people look at and, and say definitely has an NFL, an NFL future. But I don't really know in terms of his health and, and you know, coming off of uh, not, you know, basically not playing at all almost uh, last year. He, he's going to have to prove some things this year. And I think that he's a guy that will also look at his stock and think the longer he stays, the better chance that it goes up. And then Kyler McMichael, 
there's no guarantee that he ends up leaving after this season. All these guys, I think, have a chance to leave, but I think they would have to have pretty tremendous seasons for that to actually happen. So you have all those guys potentially coming back. DeAndre Hollins is a guy you would think that is a senior from how long it feels like he's been there, but he's only a junior. And, I mean, the depth here is really good, and you're not, you don't have anybody that you know for sure is leaving at the end of the season. And then you talk about the fact that you're also bringing in Allen and Holloway. So I think Carolina is in a pretty good spot regardless of what they want to do here. Uh, I think they've got a lot of options here, but uh, I, I would say as of right now, I think you're definitely right. There's nobody else that you see on their offer board that they probably are going to make a run at. I know they offered Rodney Johnson, a cornerback, a three-star corner out of the state of Alabama a few weeks back. Um, I don't think there's really anything serious there as of right now. Maybe that's something that grows uh, over the next uh, you know, few months. I think he's a guy that's probably, he looks at least right now, like he could be a little bit of, uh, away from, you know, of ways away from a decision. But I think, uh, you know, as of right now, Carolina just, you know, they put the offer out there, but I'm not sure if uh, he's a guy that they are really prioritizing uh, in this uh, recruiting class. So we'll just have to wait and see. But it's definitely one of those positions where Carolina, I think, feels confident with what they've already got in this class. So Carolina, uh, you know, we've touched on uh, those two topics so far. So let's move to, you know, a look at the uh, guys that are going to end up uh, making commitments here soon. You've got two guys that had the Tar Heels inside of their final three. Uh, I know that one of them was relatively shocking. Uh, the other one, not as shocking. Um, Addison Nichols was a guy that Carolina, I think, you know, maybe behind the scenes probably felt a little bit better for than a lot of people realize. They landed in his top three, um, and uh, he, he now has set his commitment date for August 2nd. Uh, that will be uh, on, mon- on uh, Sunday, actually. And, you know, this is one, I mean, Carolina, they have fought their way back into this. Uh, I mean, they were one of the teams that for a while, nobody, I mean, he. I remember he had released the top schools list. I think it was either seven or ten, and Carolina was not involved. So they fought back from that, made up a lot of headway with him, hosted him on campus during uh, the month of June, and they definitely got themselves in, in decent standing here. But it feels like at this point, uh, it's a two-horse race between Ohio State and Tennessee. Honestly, it feels like Tennessee's probably the lean here um, for him as he heads into his recruitment. Um, but, you know, I, I think that Carolina is okay with that. This was one of those guys that I think, again, uh, was someone that they would definitely have taken if he had wanted to commit to Carolina. But I don't think this is a huge need for the Tar Heels in the class. So I think that even if they miss on him, this is not going to be an area where Carolina is going to try to force something, offer you know a couple of other guys here to try to find his replacement. And they only have two interior line offers in this class. What do you think about Addison Nichols uh, heading into his commitment? And, and, and do you think that this is a position where Carolina is probably feeling secure no matter the direction that this goes? I think so, yeah. I think, uh, as we mentioned, I mean, they already have two offensive line uh, commits in this class uh, for a class that was not looking to be, you know, a huge offensive line class. Uh, really, everything moving forward was sort of icing on the cake for, you know, taking guys that are too good uh, to pass up, um, of which Addison Nichols would fit into that category. Um but, you know, like you mentioned, I think that Tennessee is the likely selection here, has family connections there. So even with a new head coach, um, Josh Heifel getting off to a strong start with this offensive lineman. But I think that North Carolina overall is likely fine. I mean, for a long time, like you mentioned, there was not really a lot of on-the-surface or public buzz surrounding North Carolina. It was schools like Tennessee, like Ohio State, and Georgia uh, was another one in there. So there was not a um, you know significant amount of really knowledge of where North Carolina stood in this recruitment until he released that top three. 
So, you know, from the fans' perspective, you really weren't expecting anything, and then you got a little bit of hope um, in there. But I think the most important point for me is that when you still have a guy like Zach Rice on the board and everything is really just icing on the cake at this point, and you do feel good uh, about Zach Rice and where you stand in that recruitment, it, it may be one where you just want to, you know, put all your chips on that and, you know, let things fall where they will. Um, and, you know, I, I think that um, they're, they're perfectly fine being in that position, sort of going all in on, you know, the, the top-rated guy as opposed to just, you know, taking nickels if that was an option and just sort of leaving it there as such. Yeah, I think, you know, you look at the depth that's on the roster already right now, and I think you look at some of the guys that Carolina has brought in recently, and you would look at a lot of these guys and think that they probably project inside better than they do on the outside. I mean, Diego Pounds is one of those guys I think that you can kind of put anywhere. Uh, I compared him, you know, when he ended up committing to Carolina to Joshua Zudu, and he's a true freshman. So he's a guy that over the next couple of years you're going to be able to use there. Jonathan Adorno is another guy. They could use him at center once Brian Anderson ends up leaving, but I think there's a good possibility that he could also be a guy that Carolina could use at guard uh, if they keep Anderson, if Anderson decides to stay for an extra year, or if they find another guy that they can use there at that center position, and then I mean you're you're even talking about guys like Malik McGowan, who you know I, I think some people probably forget about from a couple of years ago. Uh, you know he's a redshirt freshman uh, this season on the roster, and he's a guy that I think could end up making an impact there as well. Uh, and you know, again, Joshua Zudu's not going anywhere probably after this year. I mean, I think there's a chance because he's a guy that coming in is a first team All ACC preseason selection. So I think there's definitely a chance, but I, I think he's a guy that probably will end up staying for that senior year. I'd be shocked if he ends up bolting to the NFL, but th- there's uh, uh, this is another group, especially on the interior of that offensive line, where you feel pretty confident about what you've got there. And that's not even to mention the fact that you've had the emergence of William Barnes this year, a guy that we've been waiting on for a long time to sort of live up to his potential he's going to be back next year as well and potentially even the year after that so Carolina's got some really really solid pieces here it's one where if they you know if if he wanted the spot he could have taken a spot because he met sort of that elite prospect requirement that they were looking for but it's not a position where they really need to panic um it, it feels like the same thing, of course, at wide receiver. Wide receiver, the Tar Heels are loaded. Of course, they probably want to add one uh, or two guys in this class uh, besides Tychon Chapman. But, I mean, look, Carolina, uh, they, they've at this point, uh, they've pretty much prioritized uh, one of their targets over the other. Sherlick Knotts is the guy who is going to make his decision on Sunday, August 15th. Um, that was moved back a day from his original announcement date. He was supposed to announce on Saturday, August 14th. He's now moved that back to the 15th. Carolina, one of the final three for him, along with Tennessee and uh, Maryland. But this is one where, I'm going to be honest with you, I think it shocked a lot of Tar Heel fans uh, you know, that follow recruiting in depth when he ended up uh, you know, putting the Tar Heels in his top three. I know that you know, the Tar Heels were in a good spot for him early on. Uh, they you know, were definitely sort of playing it out. And you know, being that he was an in-state guy, I feel like they uh, were, you know, knew that they had to do their homework on him and have a good, you know, solid relationship with him. But it feels like at this point, uh, they've sort of prioritized Andre Green Jr. out of the state of Virginia, uh, a bigger frame than Knotts, a guy that can go up and get the football a little bit better than him. They've kind of prioritized him as their guy in this class uh, if they're going to land another wide receiver. So it feels like coming in, Carolina doesn't really stand much of a chance to land this commitment, but I I think it's one, Zach, that some people may look at, and especially when he ends up committing, people may say, well, 
level. Why was Carolina not more, you know, locked in on on an in-state four-star wide receiver? But it, it feels like ultimately, especially with the guys that are already in place, with them prioritizing Andre Green Jr., that the Tar Heel staff just kind of had to, you know, get some of their targets in line and figure out, uh, be a little bit picky here on which one uh, they actually wanted. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, and it certainly appears at the very least they may end up taking three wide receivers if that is an option moving forward. But it really seems like you mentioned that they're focused primarily on Andre Green Jr. first and foremost and are really waiting to see what he does before they make any sort of dis- uh, other decisions at the position. I mean, you look at the roster as it stands right now, um, you, you are at 10 you know, wide receivers, 10 scholarship wide receivers uh, with two potential seniors in Bo Corrales and Antoine Green but I believe Antoine Green may have the option of you know having an extra year sort of with that COVID year mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaken and a lot of these other guys that you look at on the roster are underclassmen they've been taking three or four wide receivers pretty much every class since Matt Brown and offensive coordinator Phil Longo have been there so it's a position that you know, they stack heavy with talent, and it's one that they most likely plan to stack a few guys uh, on in the 2023 class. So I think if there's a class that's going to be smaller, it does look to be this 2022 class, and they are sort of looking at Andre Green first and foremost. Now, from what I've heard, amongst his three finalists of Maryland, Tennessee, and North Carolina, Maryland has been the one that's perceived as the favorite, and they are they have been the one that's been pushing the hardest. Um, obviously, as we've stated, with a focus on Andre Green Jr., we know that North Carolina hasn't been pushing as much. So, uh, but we also have heard that Tennessee has not really been pushing as much either. So, I, I think that it's a situation in which it sounds like coaching staffs may not have as high of an opinion on this guy as the recruiting industry does. Now, personally, I still like him quite a bit. I would not be upset at all if he ended up in this recruiting class. And I would note, you know, this is going into a a commitment, as you mentioned, on August the 15th. He's not signing on August the 15th. This would, you know, still be an open recruitment going into the fall and into the winter, depending on when he signs his national letter of intent, whether that be in December or in February. So I think that, and it, it may sound a little arrogant, uh, but the, I think that there is a situation or a potential scenario in which if Andre Green goes elsewhere, you know, North Carolina could swing back around, kick the tires on dots, and, you know, who's to say where it goes from there in terms of that recruitment? So it does not look like it's going to be North Carolina here in August, uh, but I do still think that at least in the back of your mind, this is a name to know in Tar Heel recruiting, sort of going into uh, whatever signing period he ends up signing. I'm with you, and I don't think it's arrogance at all. I think it's really just looking at the prospect, seeing what he, you know, how he was sort of approached his recruitment. And again, I mean, who knows? He could be a guy that absolutely loves everything and anything about Maryland, but it just doesn't get released or talked about. But he's a four-star prospect. You feel like if he was a guy that was that closely tied to Maryland, one, this decision would have been made earlier. And two, you would feel like there would be a lot more reporting on it. Um, I feel like this is a guy, because of where Carolina stood with him early on, I think you're right. I think if they end up missing on Andre Green Jr., and I think the unfortunate thing right now is that with Green Jr., it looks like this is going to go into the season. This this could take a while, and if it goes into the season, it usually means that, barring something shocking, and I mean, there are some guys that decide in season, but it will more than likely probably go down to the last few days or possibly even on early signing day. It will go down to that point. You then have to wonder if he ends if 
Knotts ends up signing with Maryland, with Tennessee if he ends up committing there, which I don't think that's going to be the pick. I do think it's going to be Maryland for him. Um, but, yeah, I think if he ends up deciding earlier, Green Jr., that is, uh, then, yeah, I think uh, if it doesn't go Carolina's way, I really do think that they could – make a push here and you could see a potential flip for sure because he's a guy that I really think has a high opinion of Carolina, has a high opinion of the offense and I think a lot of people feel like he could do some damage in this offense. I think the biggest thing that I noticed from him when I watched his film, and he's a great kid. I've, I've met him before. I've talked to him. I've interviewed him uh, when, when I uh, covered him for or no, I didn't interview him. That's right. He he actually got injured in the game that I went and saw from him two years ago. Um, but I talked to him. I've I've talked to him before as well because he's close to where I live uh, around this area. Um, he he's a guy that when I watched him on in in his game that he played this year that I watched of him and did a scouting report on him. There were just times where you could see that he wasn't giving 100% on every single play, or at least that's what I evaluated. So I I think that might be one of the reasons that he has sort of dropped from a a five-star prospect to a four-star prospect, and you're not seeing some of these elite teams that – did offer him. He does have some really prestigious offers, um, but you're not seeing some of the big names that you would normally expect for a prospect that is as highly rated as he is. I think that that's the reason why, but we'll, we'll see. I do think, like you said, Carolina, if they want to jump back into their this recruitment, I really feel like they're going to have a chance. And yeah, at this point, it feels like, especially with the depth that is there, with how many guys they've taken in the last two classes at wide receiver, uh, this is going to be a year where in a smaller class, they are more than likely going to take two wide receivers and it's something that you should not be concerned about at all uh, when, when it comes to the amount of guys on this roster, the the you know competitive depth of this roster. That's one position at wide receiver right now that you will not have to worry about uh, for a while. So uh, that wraps it up for this edition of the podcast, guys. Uh, great stuff, uh, you know, on the recruiting side of things going on right now. Carolina, uh, as you know, we started off the podcast saying land Sebastian Cheek. So make sure that you guys go over to the website heeltoughblog.com. Check that out uh, on there. Um, there's uh, you know a couple other things that we've got going up there right now that uh, we think you guys will really enjoy uh, on the you know on the field side of things. We've got uh, a position previews for the Toriels this uh, upcoming season, 2021 season. The guys that will currently be on the roster. We break down each position group in depth. We've got that up on the website for you guys. So make sure that you guys go and check those out. We've got uh, you know the offense, all of the offensive position groups up already the defensive position groups. We've got a uh, defensive lineup. Linebacker will be going up tomorrow. And then uh, from there, we're also going to get defensive backs and then special teams up uh, as quickly as we possibly can. There's so much stuff going on right now. And, uh, you know, a cr- li- little bit crazy with everything that's going on uh, on the uh, full-time job side of things for me personally. So I'm trying to get all of that stuff up as quickly as I can. Uh, thank you guys for bearing with me through all this. But we're going to get it up before for the start uh, of fall camp for the Tar Heels. And then, of course, we'll have your preview for fall camp. Uh, we'll look at you know some of the bigger storylines heading in for the Tar Heels and then have you covered throughout fall camp uh, as Mac Brown will definitely be speaking to the media multiple times during fall uh, camp as well as probably some of the position coaches will also be up there and uh, possibly some players. So we'll keep an eye on all of that. Tell you our biggest takeaways from those press conferences when they do happen uh, so that we have you covered on everything that's going on. And then, of course, we'll have you covered right up until game week when Carolina uh, heads up to Black Blacksburg for the first game of the season to take on the Virginia Tech Hokies. So uh, great stuff on the website side of things for football. Uh, same thing with basketball. Josh has you covered throughout the offseason for basketball. Uh, right now, a little bit 
quiet on the basketball front. He's going to have some articles that he's going to be putting up, though, over the next couple of weeks that are going to get you ready for the season. And uh, hopefully that ACC schedule is coming out sometime soon. And when it does, he will have you covered on that front. You can go back and read the non-conference schedule breakdown if you guys are interested in that over on the website uh, as well. Uh, podcasts both there as well. There are tabs at the top of the page for both of those. Uh, you got the Heel Tough Blog podcast, which you're listening to now. Uh, you can listen to it on the website. And then uh, the Four Corners podcast tab is right next to it there as well. If you are a listener to the podcast, make sure that you subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. We're on all of the major podcast platforms. So if you're an Apple podcast person, Google podcast, Spotify, any of those uh, major ones, make sure that you subscribe uh, and you'll get all of the new additions right in your social media feed. And then, of course, if you are a watcher of the uh, video editions of the podcast, uh, make sure that you like and follow the Facebook page. Do that anyways if you're uh, you know somebody that listens to the audio editions or even somebody that just reads the articles. Uh, it's a great way to uh, be able to have all of that stuff on your timeline. It's a great way to make sure that you don't miss any of the stuff that we're putting up uh, and uh, we would also greatly appreciate it uh, you know sort of ha- helps us get a little more recognition uh, in the long run as well uh, go over same thing on uh, on Twitter uh, it is at Heel Tough Blog on Twitter that is the Twitter handle for uh, the official page and then uh, for us on social media it's me at HTB Anthony on Twitter Zach is at Hack Zubber 2 on Twitter and then Josh is at HTB Josh on Twitter. So that wraps it up for this edition of the podcast. Want to thank Zach for hosting with me. Want to thank you guys for listening. And as always, go Tar Heels. <laughs>